Welcome everyone to Art Migrating Across Borders with artist Rennie Young. My name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. I'd like to thank those of you who elected to support this event and pay a little something um, to attend. It really does go a long way to help us do more free events like this in these challenging times. <clears throat> For those of you who are unfamiliar with Mechanics Institute, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, the oldest, in fact, designed to serve the general public in California. We're also a cultural event center and a world-renowned chess club that is the oldest in the nation. I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It's only $120 a year, and with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area, which we've been doing for the last 167 years. I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Renny Young is a member of the Mechanics Institute. Uh, she is also an artist, a writer, a cultural activist, and designer whose transdisciplinary work um, works to connect people, places, and history uh, to both articulate the hidden and give form to the overlooked. She is the founder of Chinese Whispers, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to giving voice to the undertold history of the Chinese in the American West. And through Chinese Whispers is actually how I met Renny um, years ago. So I'm fond of that organization. Um, she has collaborated with a number of local, national, and international organizations and received awards from the California Arts Council, Creative Work Fund, Humanities California, the Exploratorium, Headland Center for the Arts, Montalvo Center for the Arts, and Hedgebrook Writers Residency. Meanwhile, she found the time to graduate from Stanford University and now lives in San Francisco. Um, before we get started, I wanna encourage our guests to use the chat space. And if they have any questions, we will get to them at the end of the reading. I will also send, as I mentioned earlier, all registered guests a link to the events video in a couple of days. Thank you so much, Rennie, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Karen, for this opportunity to be here. Um, I'm really excited. We've talked about doing something together um, with the Mechanics Institute since our long, heady conversation years ago. And I've always loved um, everything about mechanics um, from that beautiful space um, and the kind of programming that you do there. And it really is a hidden gem in San Francisco. So thank you and Mechanics Institute for this opportunity. And of course, I want to welcome and thank everyone um, who um, is spending a little bit of their evening time here um, in this program. So I'm going to talk um, about some ideas and then I'm going to show some pictures. Usually when I do artist talks, you know, we launch into images of artworks and so on and so forth. And this is a really fun opportunity for me to sort of step back and say, what's actually the underlying thread? What, what holds these things together? Which is really what matters to me um, when I am making art. And so I'll uh, talk about some ideas and then I'll um, show some images about um, some projects. And um, let's see, I am... Um, there we go. So I'm an immigrant. I came from Hong Kong um, when I was 14 years old, which um, is very, very, very long ago, but it still makes me an immigrant. And um, we are here on 
unceded Yelamu Ohlone land. What does it mean to be an immigrant on land that was stolen? What is the land of the immigrant? So I thought it would be interesting to look at um, the meaning of immigration. This is what Wikipedia says. International movement of people to a destination country of which they are not natives or where they do not possess citizenship in order to settle as permanent residents or naturalized citizens. Now I highlighted um, of which they're not natives and where they do not possess citizenship. Um, I'm a naturalized citizen, but still the naturalized makes it feel like, you know, prior to that you are unnatural. And this status of kind of um, supplicant status brings up really issues of belonging in place, which is um, really key in my work and in my investigations and in my daily life. And this is also work, uh, a situation that brings up issues of borders and intersections. Every immigrant is intersectional. We were intersectional long before intersectionality became a hip buzzword. You have to be navigating different borders. You're crossing borders. You are intersecting uh, cultures, languages, customs, ways of seeing, ways of being in our bodies. The ways that, the things that don't really get talked about because it is so embedded. And of course, we're crossing boundaries of geographies, of histories, and it's really an ecology of being is how I think of it, these intersections. That is an interconnected whole and is a dynamic system. And that is also how I think of my artwork, not as products or within certain disciplines um, or projects um, packaged by certain exhibitions, but really this system. And so art that migrates across borders, in my thinking, it's transdisciplinary, meaning instead of say interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, where it is additive, you know, you put this and that together, or maybe two kinds of disciplines talk to each other in a transdisciplinary way, the whole thing comes together and gets transformed into a new, um, a new existence. And it unfolds over time. It's layered and it engages communities, partners, it cannot be solitary. And the metaphor actually that, um, I'm gonna go back to this slide. The metaphor that I actually um, really enjoy is um, that of the mycelium, which is the five, uh, the, these kind of thread-like parts of fungi that grow and connect and talk to each other. They can be microscopic, they can be thousands of acres huge, their networks. And I think of history as this mycelium, rather than as this unit thing, this linear thing, the kind of the way that we were taught in school, you know, this happens, and then that happens, and then that happens. It's a lot of this and that happens in these intersecting lines. And that's really, to me, really fascinating. And so in making art, I want to create this network of investigations and expressions at different scales and intersecting with relevant sectors and disciplines. And they typically take years because we're building relationships with these projects. Um, and so again, as an immigrant, these inquiries focus on belonging and of course unbelonging because they're really different sides of the same coin. What is seen and what is hidden, an act of erasure, an act of presencing. 
So I'm going to go into some case studies. Some of you may be familiar with some of the projects, uh, especially Chinese Whispers, which I've um, um, talked about a fair bit and presented on. And I notice in the chat, in the participants list, there are some um, performers from Chinese Whispers, uh, volunteers and community. And I'm so grateful for you to, to be here and for your um, participation in the project. So Chinese whispers really came out of a convergence of different things. Um, probably the catalyst was when I did an um, exhibition in Boise, Idaho, about the 19th century Chinese um, there. And people started, community people started coming and telling me stories about the backwoods Chinese in the frontier community. And they were fascinating stories. And I really wanted to capture that kind of apocryphal way that history is learned, the way that narrative gets layered word by word, handed down from person to person. And at the same time, I was doing a public art project in East Oakland that I called Our Oakland, which involved community building, storytelling website uh, long before digital storytelling was sort of an everyday word. Um, and these were stories by and about East Oakland um, community members and architectural artwork. So this kind of helped me develop a methodology of integrated uh, community engaged multi-platform approach. And also they were about place finding um, projects. And so it, Chinese Whispers began with Sierra's stories which unfolded in the um, Sierra Nevada foothills. Um, of course, along the route of the transcontinental railroad that Chinese immigrants helped build. The map on the right is actually this beautiful silk map from the 1800s that uh, showed the early stages of the transcontinental railroad going through the foothills. On the bottom left is the famous photo I'm sure you've seen. Um, this is the long trestle, which um, Chinese laborers helped build this amazing engineering feat. And on the right, a likely or probable contemporary view of, of that site. So this is really about taking the story to place and trying to find the stories from the place. And it resulted in um, a community storytelling um, theater work where community members were on stage telling their own stories or their family stories. And so when I came back to San Francisco, I thought, hey, we've got to do something here in the Bay Area in my home, hometown. And so Golden Gate uh, was developed through a lot of collaborations with community organizations, partners. We collaborated with the um, Chinatown YMCA, with um, historical organizations, um, did events, annual events on um, historical vessels, because I also became really interested in the maritime history of the Chinese in San Francisco. And um, did a lot of intergenerational immigrant storytelling uh, workshops, which involved youth, elders, recent immigrants, long-term immigrants, in sharing their stories. And it was really restorative justice. Again, this work was done before restorative justice became sort of a hip thing to do. Um, in being able to speak what they have not been able to speak because nobody seemed really interested in these immigrant stories. That in itself was healing. And to know that then these stories would be told to a large audience really gave them a sense of empowerment. Oops. And so Golden Gate, after uh, about four, four plus years of community building um, oral histories and 
workshopping and so on, um, became uh, a theater uh, uh, theater work, a 90 minute uh, theater work uh, presented at um, Fort Mason. And uh, I believe Erlena is here. Yay, Erlena, she's the one on the right, uh, community performers. And um, some have theater background. Ford, the gentleman sitting in the chair, uh, at the time he was 84 years old and he was on stage through the whole thing telling his own personal stories. And this is a scene from, the, uh, from one of the closing scenes of the, um, of the theater work. And at the same time, we had these, you know, I was talking about the mycelium. There are multiple networks, threads going through. And Bay Chronicles was also happening while we were doing Golden Gate. When I say we, I mean Chinese Whispers as the organization. Um, it was something that certainly I could not have done just by myself. Um, and um, friends and volunteers came and um, helped make it possible as well as staff. So Bay Chronicles um, retraces the forgotten history of Chinese shrimp fishing in San Francisco Bay. Um, it started off after a huge amount of research. Uh, the most visible part of it, of course, was that we went on a uh, research expedition on a replica 19th century shrimping vessel on the bay uh, to retrace some of the routes of the former shrimping industry, which was thriving until the uh, 20th century, mid 20th century. And it was decimated by a combination of environmental degradation of the bay and essentially uh, racist um, efforts to uh, throttle the industry, which succeeded. So part of the research involved a lot of historical uh, materials. This is um, an 1889 map on the left showing shrimping sites. And on the right, a map of the route that our expedition took. Um, and just those points um, was two weeks of sales, not solid. We had to have some breaks in between. And um, there were other sites that we simply didn't have time or resources to go to. And um, the Grace Kwan is this beautiful replica um, vessel built by the San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park, one of our uh, partners. And you can see in these photos that we had media recording it in every possible way uh, with sound and video and photo. And there were GoPros um, arm, you know, everywhere on, on the ship. Um, this shows you some of the before uh, the historical and contemporary comparisons. The top row is San Bruno, which was a sizable, uh, very productive shrimping camp um, in the 19th century. It doesn't look like much, but it was a very productive camp. And on the left, its current um, uh, location, well, not current location, it, its current manifestation, which is um, a tech campus. And on the bottom, um, the Bayview um, shrimping sites, which was the last area of Chinese shrimp fishing. And on the right, uh, it was very fun. We did a sailing um, demonstration and public event in um, India Basin um, at Heron's Head. Um, and it, you know, it, it, it's interesting, I think, to see the PG&E um, power station in back. And on the right is a photograph of the late Frank Kwan, who was the last resident of China camp, uh, the only vestige left of the um, 50 or so shrimp camps that once ringed San Francisco Bay. So this is uh, an image from the, um, uh, the, the, the landing celebration after we 
finished um, our, our expedition. So now I am going to um, try to show you a video um, from, from uh, Chakman. I just see the uh, PowerPoint, Renny. Sorry? I just see the PowerPoint oh, that really? says art migrating across borders. Huh. Okay, I am sorry. When we did our, did our uh, tech test that, um, is this any better? This, it says Chinese, it's a slide that says Chinese Whispers Bay Chronicle. How annoying. Okay, so let me, um, how about now? Are you seeing? Just share your screen. Okay, I think I think this should work. There we right? go. Okay, good. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, so now, um, okay. are you seeing it? Now I, I just see you, I don't see your PowerPoint. Sorry about all these tech things. There we go. So this was um, an immersive installation at the Maritime Park using media and uh, sound video captured from the sails projected onto this um, translucent sail that um, 
is over a bench with a uh, haptic drive. And the um, drive translates the sound from the audio of the water into physical impulses. So you feel like you're sitting on the boat with the water slapping against the wood. And some people said it made them seasick. And I thought that that was a compliment. Okay, um, I am sorry. I'm not quite sure why this is not quite working right. Um, here's another view of the um, installation. And so Chinese Whispers really has this overarching um, objective, uh, vision of giving voice and visibility, just as all my work does. In this case, it is about the contributions of the Chinese in the American West. And written on water, um, developed out of Chinese Whispers, Obviously, the maritime element really inspired me. And um, it is both uh, a set of artists' um, books, each one about a particular shrimping site, and also a, a larger written manuscript that uh, a writing project that I'm working on. This particular book, Lacrimal, is about uh, Hunter's Point. Um, lacrimal is Latin for tears. Well, you know, adjective connected with weeping and tears. And it relates to the sad history of um, how the Hunters Point shipyards ended um, being burned down by the, uh, by the health department on pretext of sanitation grounds. But really, it was to make way for the naval shipyard on the eve of Second World War. And um, at the back of the book, there are maps, uh, there's a map of, of other shrimping sites and this little vial contains in it um, one millimeter of salt water that is made um, from salt that I made, um, distilled out of seawater collected at the approximate site of the last Chinese shrimp camp in India Basin. And then with the salt, I turn around and make salt water again in the approximate salinity of human tears. So it's classed in between these, um, these um, plaster blocks and um, it's a small memorial to a huge human tragedy that affected all these people that have been forgotten and a history that really has been forgotten. This is a book called Mordant and it's about um, China camp. And mordant is made from uh, botanical prints of vegetation gathered around the water's edge at China Camp. Um, these, I think, are primarily pickleweed. So they are like ghost memories of the environment around which the Chinese shrimp fishermen would have um, lived their daily lives. And in the back is. Um, uh, of that book is uh, a little dried shrimp um, and a quote from Frank Kwan about the hamai, the Chinese name for dried shrimp, which of course was the focus of the whole shrimping industry and um, as a tribute um, to, this, to, this, um, to this story. So now I'm going to go to another project that was also happening. Uh, there are all these things that are happening at the same time. City Beneath the City um, was about the Market Street Chinatown in San Jose. It was San Jose's first Chinatown. And as you can see from the dates, um, it ended in 1887 due to an arson fire. This was around the time of the furious anti-Chinese um, movement in the 19th century, which resulted in, among other things, the shameful milestone of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. So the Market Street Chinatown was burned down and archeologists were able to salvage a lot of artifacts from the former site when uh, it was dug up for rebuilding by the city of San Jose. The archaeologists expected, this was in collaboration with the Stanford Archaeology Center, 
and also with um, History San Jose, um, Chinese um, Historical Cultural Project, and with San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art. Um, and everybody sort of expected me to pick a pretty artifact. Now, this was a laborer's community. So first of all, their artifacts were not like fine objects. And second of all, this was a ruptured history. It was a history of destruction and arson and hate. And so I chose the fragments. These were shards of broken glass. You can see how the heat had turned them iridescent. And so as you enter the exhibition, you would be greeted by this pile of broken glass. And it's sort of like a, a little, uh, it's like a low tombstone um, for Market Street Chinatown. And in the back, you see this table set with remnants of dishes from, um, um, most of them were broken as if it was a banquet that suddenly had been interrupted and other objects. The chair in the back was actually an observation post. Um, the archeology span de department um, wanted to send students to observe the behavior of visitors. And I thought, okay, if you're going to do that, um, I would like to really make it very obvious, make it transparent. And I made this sort of a throne for them to sit at. Um, I got a lot of pushback. It was like, making it too transparent, right? The power dynamics. But eventually um, that was set up and there's a binder that um, has pages that people can write um, their commentaries on. And as it turned out, um, audience members, community members were the ones who sat in that chair most writing their thoughts and observations and words from um, archeological reports about Market Street Chinatown were a you know, I use them to put them on um, different um, parts of the installation. This is its second iteration at uh, Stanford and in the Archaeology Center. So the artifacts were adapted for display in the institutional environment of, of the university. But the same thing, um, words from the archaeology reports were extracted, almost like uh, concrete poetry that spoke against and to the broken artifacts of the lives of a broken community. And the third iteration was at the San Jose Museum of Art. So I chose just one bowl. And juxtaposed it against a uh, seven foot by nine foot charcoal drawing I had done of a bowl of rice. In Chinese, the bowl, one's rice bowl, bowl of rice, is one's livelihood, one's means of living. And it's the sustenance for which immigrants came to America. And so it seemed fitting to contrast the broken rice bowl destroyed by arson with this symbolic full bowl of rice. And I chose a room in the museum that actually overlooked the exact spot of the former site of Market Street Chinatown, so that geography, history, archeology, span and art were in conversation together at the same time. Oh, and a little side note, it's very funny. Um, that bowl in the, in the case uh, was actually quite broken um, when, I was, when I first saw it and when it was presented in the other two exhibitions. But for the museum, the archeology span archeologists couldn't stand putting a broken bowl in a museum. And they actually went and repaired it to make it look whole. And I think that that was an interesting commentary on how we think of history and how we think about the things that aren't very nice and try to repair it. And so it's ironic that in the project that is talking about um, unearthing the, um, making visible the hidden, the act to um, kind of make it cosmetic is happening all over again. So I also wanna show some drawings. Um, when we think of erasure, 
you know, you think of a big eraser and you're scrubbing it out, right? But covering up is also a form of erasure. And erasing and hiding really is an intentional act. Why do people do that? Because they don't feel good about something. That's why they have to hide it. That's why they have to erase it, right? And so these are drawings that are about mm, four by uh, about 50 inches high. And they are layer upon layer of cross hatching that cover up, that do uh, an active form of erasure. And they're cross hatchings, which in Western um, artistic traditions are used to create visible shapes and chiaroscuro. And here it is used to cover and flatten. And on the right is a, um, erasure drawing based on a map of the Hong Kong protest sites during the 2019 protest, which affected me very deeply. And so it seemed appropriate that erasure would be part of the um, language. This is maybe a different effort of mark making. These are like big arm swings to create these gestural marks. It's a 15 foot long scroll that was um, that I did at Headlands when I was in residence there, there earlier this year. And each mark is a statement of sort of saying, hey, I'm trying to find my place. I am marking my place. That they end up looking like waves, like water, was not my original intention at all. But um, I think everything kind of feeds back to itself. And lastly, I'm going to talk about a project that came out of the pandemic. As the pandemic, um, I think um, some of you actually participated in it. It was it, it came out of lockdown when we couldn't go anywhere, we didn't have like, you know, we, we couldn't have the kind of exchanges that we were used to. And so I came up with this project that unfolded simultaneously as an Instagram project and as um, an installation at Headlands to create an accessible space for community voices to ask questions and make responses about our quandary during the pandemic. And post-its um, were used as a medium, are used as a medium for these messages. And they're directly inspired by the Lenin walls that were um, in the Hong Kong protests um, as an anti-memorial to the historical time. So now um, I'm going to um, do this um, bear with me while I try to, um, let's see if we can get, are you seeing the video? Um, I'm not seeing the video. You're not seeing the Although video. Okay. It's frozen for me. So I'm not sure if it's just my bandwidth or, or what, what is, uh, are you just seeing an image of the video? I see the last image you had and it's frozen for me, but you're moving around just fine. Okay. okay. Um, now I see, okay, it seems to be working. You're moving through the slides. Yeah, but I wanted to move to a, um, um, okay. There, so, there you are. There we go. Okay. So these are, this is. Is there sorry. sound on the video? Not yet. Is there sound now? Because I don't hear anything.
Rennie, is there sound on this video? Are you hearing it? No. Oh. Yeah, is there any no, sound now? No, there's no sound. Okay. Um, are you hearing me? I hear you just fine. Okay. Then what I'm going to do is just scroll through very quickly and um, I'll be the voiceover. <laughs> Um, let's see. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with the Hong Kong um, Lenin walls, this this is a view of it. Um, and since we don't have the um, sound, I'm going to just pardon me move through this very quickly um, to show you what the Instagram part looks like with um, over 300 um, entries. Okay, so I'm going to exit this video. I wonder why the um, audio didn't work, but um, that's all right. Are you seeing the um, PowerPoint? Yes, and we can include the links to those videos. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Email after today. Okay, so this is a view of the installation um, partially done at Headlands um, while it was happening during the pandemic. And a new iteration of it is actually happening right now in, the, um, in Seattle at the Wing Luke Museum this really wonderful um, museum in the International District Chinatown in Seattle. Um, and the exhibition um, looks at what the pandemic experience has been like for the APA, uh, Asian Pacific American community. And so um, I would love it if people would um, contribute questions and post-its so here's what you need to do. Um, if you're not on Instagram, um, I can make a post that um, tells you how to participate on, on Facebook. But um, there are two prompts that we'd like people to answer, uh, to answer. What did you learn during the pandemic? And what was hardest for your community? And your community doesn't have to be APA, it could be whatever. Um, and to participate, write your answer on post-it, snap a phone photo of it, and then post it on Instagram with the hashtag AskThePandemic and tag at Rennie Young Studio and also tag at, at Wing Luke Museum. If you tag me, um, I will forward it to them if you don't want to tag so many things, but that's sort of the nature of, of uh, Instagram. Or if you don't want to take a photo, you can write your answers um, in the comment sections of an Ask the Pandemic post, and those are going to get um, um, get going um, this week. So hopefully we can um, build a new momentum. For the Headlands um, iteration of Ask the Pandemic, people posted all the way from um, Australia, Europe, Asia, and of course, North America. Um, and it was really um, an interesting way to build community and to spread that mycelium. And so here's some um, URLs to find out more about Chinese Whispers. Um, it's Chinese-Whispers.org and Ask the Pandemic um, on Instagram and my website um and i believe this talk is going to be recorded so um there you know you have ways of finding us so in summary i want to say that this work is transpersonal and it's a cohesive whole that's inseparable from the living of life and when these engage engagements are authentic the process sparks a transformative alchemy of mutual trust between artists, community, 
partners, um, institutions that transcends the circumstances to create a larger whole. And I believe to create the healing that our society needs. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was really thoughtful on a variety of levels. Um, I wonder if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat space. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit to um, the first question by Sharon. She asked what the replica boat, the Chinese um, 19th century Chinese shrimp junk, why was it called the Grace Kwan? Who is that named after? Grace Kwan um, was the um, mother of Frank Kwan at China Camp. And he was oh. instrumental in, in the whole shrimp fishing um, rena uh, renaissance. Great answer. Um, all right. Um, there was a little bit of confusion. I wonder, was were you referring to Market Street in San Francisco or Market Street in San Jose? San we Jose. Oh, San Jose. OK. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, and then. There is a nice question from Valerie. She says she saw a presentation of Chinese Whispers on stage several years ago and loved it. And you, you and I have talked about some stage things um, before. Um, but she asks, are there any plans to have another stage performance of Chinese Whispers? Well, you know, um, I am taking a little pause from the stage productions right now, especially under um, while pan the pandemic's effects are still unclear. I think um, it is really confusing. And because we're working so heavily with community, it's a lot of pieces, a lot of, you know, it's a, a huge jigsaw. So I'm taking this time to actually focus on some writing projects. But yes, um, the, the, the stage um, work is just, um, it's, it's, it's addictive, what can I say? <laughs> yes, and Valerie, the picture behind me is the Institute Library. And so uh, Rennie and I have talked in the past about trying to do something to use that space in an evocative way. So I will twist your arm. <laughs> In the meantime, uh, lots of compliments on your presentation, which I think kind of has stunned a lot of us, uh, the themes that you brought up about, you know, the many layeredness of history and erasure. Um, uh, Grace has a question for you. She says, did you draw any ties between what was going on in Hong Kong and the USA during um, uh, President Trump's uh, time in the White House. Um, yeah, but it's making me feel ill <laughs> just to think of the ties. <laughs> um, yeah, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I I think that um, it is a really tragic. Um, it, that's very funny. Kitty wants to be part of the scene. Um, it, it's. The whole um, situation in Hong Kong is tragic, and especially for someone from there. You know, I feel like in my heart, I'm still a Hong Konger. And to see the place get essentially just um, stomped down um, is, is, is heartbreaking. And perhaps we should be I say that in America, we should consider ourselves lucky that the political system we have um, fraught with problems as it is, is not allowing as yet that kind of authoritarian um, shutdown of democracy and rights. Um, that is true. Um, Grace has another question. Uh, how much of your stage work is bilingual? You know, that would have been a budget thing. Um, all the workshops were bilingual. 
you know, and um, some of the production was bilingual, some of the stories or phrases. Uh, I would have liked to have had, um, for example, bilingual subtitles. Um, and also, you know, it, it, it's a very complicated thing of um, audience. The audience was primarily English speaking. Um, and so to have a fully bilingual production would be, it can be done. It would be, you know, um, uh, something to hash over with a bilingual dramaturg, some serious work. It would be fascinating work, but it's a major endeavor. Yeah, it would be really challenging, especially, well, maybe it'd be made easier with a virtual environment. I don't, I don't know either, but. Um, um, and then Sharon has a quick question. Can others see what was written on the post-it notes? And yes, right? Yeah. Um, the, okay, so a little bit of explanation that the video would have gone into. Um, for the headlands installation, many of the post-it notes were blank because nobody could go in person to write, right? Some people wrote handwritten post-its and mailed them to me and I went there and stuck them on the wall. Um, and that's why I developed the Instagram component so that they could be visible and seen and seen by way more people than would go to Headlands to look at the installation. Um, uh, someone named Japan has a comment. Um, being an immigrant him, by herself, this presentation is thought provoking. And in regards to the Scandinavian culture, I and my friends come out of, I will share the recording with them. Oh, she, Japan is gonna share the recording of this event. So that's great. Thank cool. you very much. Cool. <laughs> and um, does anyone else have any questions to pose to Renee? I mean, to Renee? All right. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's not Japan, it's Elise, Elise, my friend. Oh. Um. <laughs> but I'm glad you know her. I'm glad you know her. Um, Janine asks if, in Ask the Pandemic, were there comments that surprised you? There were comments that touched me, you know. Um, it's very funny. I know Janine from a writing group. And one of the posts um, that I showed in, in, in my um, PowerPoint says, what is a taste of hope? And I was sure it was a comment by one of, of the other writers in our group. And when I thanked her for that wonderful um, suggestion, she said, no, 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 she, she, she didn't say it. She never said it. So whoever dreamed it up for me, um, I loved that question. What is the taste of hope? There are other questions that um, talk about, you know, the pain, the, the loss, the sadness. Um, and, you know, this all happened during the first, what, 10 months of the pandemic, or not all, but most of it happened during that time when we were really, really confused, you know, um, so many things were different. So um, I would, um, one of the things about as a pandemic is I would come up with different prompts for different people. I mean, not different, uh, for different times. So some of them were about like how, you know, ask a how question, ask a what question. And one of the questions that really hit me was who will die? Question mark, right? Because this was at a time when people were dying in huge numbers, who will die next? Um, and I, I thought that that was just one of the scariest things. And then there were some like really charming question, like um, where can I get a vegan pumpkin pie delivered for Thanksgiving? Or, um, you know, someone wrote that he, why do I want to hug the UPS delivery man? Um, you know, because they become our lifelines. So, you know, the kinds of questions and answers really ranged. Um, one last question from Bo, and I think this is a perfect last question. What is the absolute strongest thread running through all of your work? 
That's such an interesting question. Hi, Bo. Thank you for the question. Um, and I know Bo from way, way, way back as well. I think actually, I would say that um, the reason I brought up mycelium is that it is not a thread. It is a network. Mycelium can be, like I said, micro, microscopic. It could be, I think the largest one is like several thousand acres. I don't know how they do that, right? And so if there is a thread, it is the intersectionality. It is the connectivity in the inquiry of erasure and omission in narratives about marginal marginalized communities and at the same time how to give voice and visibility to counter those acts of erasure i would say you know it's not a single um single answer but it is also a networked answer because that is the perspective that I feel is most true to my vision as a human being. And I want to add something, which is that in um, what we call native cultures, as if native is a sort of a bizarre thing, many of them, they do not have a separate word for artists. And in Bali, I understand the word for artist is the same word as that for human being. And so when our lives are these network things, um, as artists, what we make is also network. And that's, that's how I see things. I, I, yeah, I found your comments on history being multi-layered and so detailed to be quite fascinating. And the way that you are folding it in to your own work is interesting as well. So thank you for that uh, connection. Um, and thank you for spending the evening with us and telling us more about what it is that you do. Well, thank you so much again for this chance. And thank you again, everyone um, who came and who asked questions. Um, it is um, such an interesting time that our community becomes this online presence with little icons and little tiny names. And yet that is our community. And um, I think that part of what I'm incubating really is how to continue to, um, to forge community within this kind of context. And I think as the pandemic was one step in that direction. Exactly, community is what you make of it. And we're forming community every day, even with these virtual events with people from all over the world. So thank you everyone for tuning in. And thank you, Rennie. And I will be sending you the video and the links to uh, Chinese Whispers and the other videos that Rennie shared with us today. Thanks, everyone, and be well and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you, and bye bye. Good night. Thanks, Taryn. Good night.